From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pete Codley, Johnny. Guaranteed transport. Oh, hiya, Pete. Seen the papers? No, I just got up. Why? What's happened? Air crash, for one thing. Air crash? Where? Mexico. Flight 6, Aztec Caribbean line. Mexico City to Havana. Crashed in the mountains ten minutes after takeoff. Seven passengers and a crew of three. Survivors? The way it sounds, none. Oh, tough. How do you come into it, Pete? We underwrite a company that handles flight insurance down there. Three of the passengers bought policies at the airport. We're stuck for $75,000. This is a nice time of the year in Mexico, Johnny. What do you want me to do? Find out why it crashed? No, I know why it crashed. Somebody meant for it to. What do you mean? That plane blew up in midair. I'll get you a reservation. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Flight 6 matter. Item 1, $173.20, airline fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Mexico City. I checked my baggage through customs and started making inquiries, and more inquiries, and then some more. And after the 14th, Ken Sabe, maybe is better you ask him, I found the office I was looking for. Or at least I thought I'd found it. The flowery Spanish title on the door translated roughly into Inspector General of the Department of Civil Air Transport. But when I opened the door, I wasn't so sure. Come in, Jack. Make yourself to home. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for the... you found him. That's me. Don't let the big words on the door fool you. I'm all there is. There ain't no more. So come in. Shut the door. All right, thanks. (laughs) Is uh, your name uh, Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. Macklin here. (sighs) Mac Macklin. One-time mongrel from the south side of Chicago. I got a wire from your office. Said you'd be in on Pan Am Flight 12. Pull up a chair and squat, will you? All right. Well, what were you expecting? (laughs) <laughs> Spanish grandee with a white silk shirt, a black silk tie, and a second cousin on the cabinet? Well, maybe. At least I wasn't figuring on a south side make with a 17th century desk and a cotton sweatshirt. Uh, well, now, here's what little dope we've got on the crash. Most of it you probably know already. I left on 20-minute notice. All I've seen is one newspaper item. I can use a lot more. Well, you won't get much more out of that report. We got a crew over at the wreckage around two hours ago. Survivors? No, he didn't have a chance. That crate is scattered over ten acres of mountainside. Didn't catch fire, though, so we might turn up something or other. Oh, I've got a good man in charge up there, Juno Romero. You'll meet him later. I'm sending another jeep up there in a few minutes, and you can go along if you want. Thanks, I will. My company figures sabotage. Any chance they're wrong? Could it have been accidental? Equipment failure, personnel failure, something like that? Well, if I thought so, I'd be up there at the wreck myself. That'd be my kind of job, but this one's different. You know, it's detective work, your kind of job. And Gino Romero's. Now, he talks as soft as a girl out of finishing school. Looks a little like one, in fact. But underneath it, he's as sharp as a tack and tougher than an old boot full of nails. What actually happened when the plane went down? All I've heard is that it blew up in midair. That's right. Well, a few Indians were on the only ones who saw it. They were burning charcoal up on a slope at about 9,000 feet. They were watching the plane circle, gaining altitude. Then one big flash, the tail blew off. The pilot didn't have a chance. He rode it straight into the side of the mountain. The tail? That sounds like the baggage compartment. That's the way I figure it. An explosive of some kind. A time bomb smuggled on board before the takeoff. I'm covering that angle from this end. I'm rounding up every one of the baggage gang, the maintenance crew, anybody who had a chance to get near that plane before it left the field out there. And what have you found out? Well, so far, nothing. We're trying to check back, too, on the individual passengers, the plane crew, trying to find out... Who might benefit by having any one of them dead? Well, I guess that'll be your angle, too. Yeah. Yeah, at least as far as insurance is concerned. Well, there were three flight policies issued, and the names are in the reports here. Yeah, I know. I've got them. The home office gave them to me, along with the names of the beneficiaries. I haven't talked to any of them yet. I figured that you know how to go about it better than I would. 
And there's another possible insurance angle, and that's the cargo. Do you know if there was anything valuable on board? Or worth destroying for the insurance, you mean? No, it was done by somebody who had deliberately set out to kill one of the ten people on board that plane. And who didn't mind killing nine others to get that one? It was premeditated, cold-blooded. Now, you get him, Johnny. Get him for me, and then just leave me alone with him for about... Uh... Come in. One of you is Senor McLean, Inspector General of the Departamento Civil. Yes, that, that's me. What can I do for you, Jack? They will not give to me any information, Senor McLean. Not the police, nor the airline office, nor oh, anything. Who are you? And what information do you want? I am Ramon de Lagos, Senor, and I am here... De Lagos? Wait a minute. That's the name of one of the... Yes. Guys. Look, uh, are you related to Maria de Lagos? My wife. She was on the plane. Now tell me, please, what news do you have? Have you reached the scene of the crash? Yes, we have. Two hours ago. And what did you... Is there any chance... I'm sorry, there were no survivors. No. Oh, no. I, I'm sorry, Senor de Lagos. It is too terrible. I, I didn't know you were here in the city, or I'd have, I'd have let you know right away. I sent word to your office in Havana. I, I have been here for six weeks... Maria came for a visit only a few days ago. No. I know, that's, that's a rough deal. I, I, I am sorry. Oh, uh, uh, this is Johnny Dollar from the States. Senor. Right, sir. He's here to investigate the cause of this thing. What is the use, Senor? It will not return life to the dead. No, but I don't like to see a murderer get away with it. A murderer? Then the rumors are true. The plane was destroyed deliberately. It is hard to believe that anyone would... Senor McLean, what arrangements are being made? The, uh, the bodies will be brought down to the Federal District Hospital, and I'll see that you're notified. Gracias, Senor. No, no, let's see. I, I believe your wife's brother, Don Serrano, is staying at the Hotel Regis. Yes, he is, but I am at the Monte Casino. Don Serrano and I are not friendly. I see. All right, Senor, then I'll contact you at the Monte Casino as soon as I have word. You are very kind. And again, I'm... Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry. I... Yes, that is all one can say. Adios, senores. Know anything about him, Mac? Well, only what his wife filled out on the flight form. He's Cuban, residence and business address Havana, in the export game. And you know, of course, that his wife was one of the three people who took out accident policies. But naming her brother, Don Serrano, as beneficiary... I wonder why. Well, that's one of the six dozen questions you can ask when you start prowling. Now, look, I hate to rush you, Johnny, but I ought to start that jeep up the mountain. I'm ready any time. I'll let Gino know you're coming. And you check with me if you want anything. You'll have full cooperation from the federal police and the government. And to repeat just one thing, Johnny. Yeah, I know. Whoever did it, get him. Check. The jeep driver was a young Mexican boy who'd been brought up in the best and wildest chauffeuring traditions of the capital. He knew only one way to drive, with both accelerator and horn wide open. Since most of the other drivers were playing the same game, it was a sheer miracle that we ever got through the narrow streets of the city and finally reached the open valley. Maybe the colored postcard pasted on the dashboard, a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe, had something to do with it. We finally left the last cart road and bumped along a narrow woodcutter's trail cleared and widened enough now so that we could drive into the crash area and miss the mile and a half walk the first rescue party had been forced to take. For some reason, only a small part of the wreckage had caught fire and burned, and the rest was strewn piecemeal along a great raw gash through the trees and brush. Men in uniforms of the Mexican army searched through the tragic debris, lifting, sorting, and collecting. And nearby, a silent group of Indians were watching, with the age-old sadness in their eyes. You are uh, Senor Dollar, no? Yes. Uh, Gino Romero, Senor. Oh, glad to know you, Gino. It's a terrible thing, no? Yeah. Any ideas yet? Uh, not of importance, but it's certain now this. It was caused by one explosion which has occurred in the baggage compartimento. Uh, venga, uh, Come on. We have found many pieces which can be identified, uh, can be known which part of the plane they are in before the crash. I see. Toward the front, these pieces are more large, but in the back, near the tail, they are very little. Oh, here, uh, you look. These are pieces of the baggage, uh, muy pequeño, hmm? uh, very tiny. 
Oh, yeah. The crash itself wouldn't have done this. It had to be an explosion. Seguro. Uh, look, it's burnt a little, each one of these pieces, but these more big ones from the seats of the plane, they are not burnt. Uh, here, uh, you smell these ones. Hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. Either dynamite or nitroglycerin. Wash dynamite. We have found little tiny pieces of red paper from the wrappings on the sticks. Wash dynamite. Any idea how much? How big a charge? One of the soldados, uh, Pascual, who have used much explosive, is think maybe 30 or 40 pounds. Light enough to be put on board in a piece of luggage. It's going to be tough, you know. Plenty tough to. They're bringing out the bodies. The Indians set up a low, wailing dirge, and one of them taps softly on a native drum. A wordless terror before the ancient mystery, death. One by one, the bodies passed us, borne by the silent soldiers. Madre de Dios, may they find peace. And then, for the first time, I noticed the girl, standing alone some distance away, watching without expression as the stretches passed her. She was young, blonde, and beautiful. Not conventionally so, but... Beautiful as a young animal is beautiful. And she looked very much out of place. You are observing the senorita, no? What's she doing up here? Quien sabe? She's strange, that one. Always she's look for danger. She's what you say, um, the, the daredevil. But it's like she always has the charm. Death has never found her. So perhaps she has come here to look on his face. Do you know who she is? Well, see. She's American. Her name is Marvel Terrence. Marvel Terrence? You have heard of her, senor? I'd heard of her, all right. And I'd wondered what kind of a girl would have a first name like Marvel. And now I knew, partly at least. And I planned to find out a whole lot more. Three of the people who died on that plane had taken out flight policies. Maria de Lagos was one of them. The other two were men both of whom had named as beneficiary Marvel Terrence. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fighting girl and a lucky break, and then murder cancels the score. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar here. Go ahead. McMacklin, Johnny. Is Gino around? Yeah, he's over across the slope at the moment. They're getting the bodies out of what's left of the plane. Well, how does it look? Anything new? Nothing we hadn't already guessed. It was an explosion, all right. Dynamite in the baggage compartment. Probably put on board in a piece of luggage. Well, that figures. 
I've run into something down here in the city along those same lines. What do you mean? The ground crew remembers one of the baggage handlers acting strange before Flight 6 took off last night. A man named Ramirez. What do you mean strange? Uh, they say he had one suitcase that he wouldn't let any of the other handlers touch. Put it on the plane himself just before takeoff. Hmm. Hey, you know anything about tigers, Mac? Tigers? I'm about to tangle with one. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. I was taking Gino Romero's word for it that the girl was a tiger. His word and my own instincts. At first glance, she seemed soft, shy, and lovely. Then you sensed a wildness about her. A kind of suppressed violence that brought you up short and made you stop and reappraise her. She leaned against a tree, watching the bodies of the plane crash victims being carried down the slope and placed in the army jeep, with no sign of emotion on her face. Cool, detached. She had no reason to be here, and I wondered why she was. The only way I knew of finding out was to ask her. Yes, what is it? You're Marvel Terrence, I believe. That's right, and I have not met you somewhere before. No, but you're about to. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an investigator for an insurance company up in the States. I'm sure it must be very interesting work. Sometimes on some jobs. Other times it's only dirty and disgusting. Like this time, for instance. Well, we all have our problems. Maybe I can help you with yours, Miss Terrence. Run along, will you? I'm not in the mood. Oh, you amaze me. I think that seeing ten bodies picked up and hauled away ought to put anyone in a gay, carefree mood. Look... Beat it. You came out here sightseeing, didn't you, 20 miles from town? So you must like this kind of thing. I had friends on that plane, Mr. Dollar. So did a lot of other people. But maybe not as good friends as you had. I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't care. E.H. Palmer and Jim Rourke? Were those your friends, Miss Terrence? Now, let's get this straight. I'm not interested in playing footsies or any other game you have in mind. You're wasting your time, Buster. Now, get going. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe you've got the wrong idea. This isn't just a social chat. No, you want to help me with my problems. Just one problem. I'm wondering how you're going to spend that $50,000. What? Yeah, that's a fair-sized chunk of money to drop right out of the sky. What are you talking about? What $50,000? The money you'll get from the deaths of your two friends, Palmer and Rourke. What do you mean? Say, tell me, were you with them at the airport last night when Flight 6 took off? Yes, I was. Then you must have known that they both took out flight policies. And that both of them named you as beneficiary. No. No, I didn't know. I I wasn't with them, exactly. At least, not up until takeoff. Then you claim this is all just a big surprise. Of course, I didn't know a thing about it. But it's just like them. It's what they do. Why did you come out here to the wreck, Miss Terrence? I don't know. Ed and Jim were my friends, and I... I don't know why I came, Mr. Dollar. She came because I brought her, mister. Hmm? No, Bill. But I didn't bring her here to be pushed around by some morbid curiosity, huh? No, please. This is Johnny Dollar, Bill. He's an insurance investigator. Bill Blakely, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello. He was asking me some questions. Why you? Because Ed and Jim both took out insurance policies in my name. What? Flight accident policies, $50,000 worth. Well, I'll Mr. Be... Blakely, you said Miss Terrence is here because you brought her. I wonder if you'd tell me why you're here. I don't know that it's any of your business. Sometimes I make things my business. Then sometime you may get your teeth knocked out. They're in pretty solid, Blakely. Yeah? Well, maybe... Bill, stop it. Sorry, Marvel. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were Bill's business partners. What business, Mr. Blakely? Engineering. We're building some roads around Mexico City. How many partners? Just the three of you? Yeah, it's just... That's right, Dollar. The business belongs to me now. What about it? Nothing about it. Congratulations. One more crack Bill, like that. Bill, I said I... stop it. Let's go, Marvel. I've got to get back to town. Wait for me at the truck. I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. Suit yourself. Dollar, 
Just one thing. Don't push me. Blakely, ten people died over there on that hillside last night. They were murdered. I intend to find out who did it. And if it takes pushing to find out, then I'll push. See you around. Yeah. You probably will. This thing hit Bill pretty hard, Mr. Dollar. You have to make allowances. How long have you known him? A couple of months. And Palmer and Rourke? The same. It's nothing serious, nothing romantic, if that's what you're thinking. It was all just for fun. Was that all it was on their side? Oh, men always claim to be serious. But that's only part of the game. What else do you do, Miss Terrence, beside play the game? That's all. I'm a wealthy orphan, Mr. Dollar, and my only career is drifting around the world playing the game. I'm ornamental, irresponsible, and rather useless. Maybe not entirely useless. Just being ornamental has some importance in this world. So you play too, huh? No, I meant it. I guess I was pretty obnoxious when you spoke to me a while ago. Well, I suppose I asked for it. I'm staying at the Hotel Monte Cassino. Are you? I'd like to see you again. I could teach you the game, Johnny. Well, that's a very attractive offer. Outside of business hours. But you think I'm mixed up in this? No, I'm not sure. Well, think about it, Johnny. And call me at my hotel. The Monte Cassino. That's where DeLagos is staying. Happen to know him? Ramon? Well, yes, of course. Why? Well, one of the passengers killed on that plane was his wife. Didn't you know? I saw the name DeLagos, but I... I didn't even know he had a wife. Another? Just for fun? I think you've got some wrong ideas about me, Johnny. Come see me and I'll straighten them out for you. All right. I will. And something else. You'll find it out anyway, so I may as well tell you. Tell me what? I had reservations on Flight 6, too. I was going over to Havana for the weekend. I canceled out at the last minute. I see. Maybe that's why I came out here. To see for myself. I'm not afraid of death. I've tempted it too many times to be. But it does fascinate me. I stood there watching and thinking. It could have been me being carried down that slope. Except for luck. Why did you cancel out at the last minute? I was talked out of making the trip. By whom? Bill Blakely. I watched her swing down the slope, lithe, erect, and lovely. A strange girl with an air of aloneness about her. An air that I felt would be with her even in a crowd. Strange, but also compelling. Exciting. She might be involved or she might not. I didn't know. But I was sure of one thing. In either case, I was going to see her again. An hour later, Gino Romero and I were heading back toward the city in the government jeep, leaving behind us the wrecked plane, the crushed trees, and the lonely slope on the mountain. You have found the young lady of interest, senor? Yeah, I found her of interest. <laughs> Always she's doing the crazy things. Daredevil, flirting with the eyes, looking for danger. Playing the game, she calls it. Si, sí, senor, playing the game. Que lastima. It is too sad that ten persons are not be playing the game now anymore. Oh, it's all right, Gino. I'm not that much under her spell. Que dice? If she's guilty in any way, I'll pin it on her just as quick as the next one. Oh, but I did it's not It's all right, mean forget that... it. No, I do not think she's guilty. It is not the thing she would do, and she does not need the money. She's very rich. Do you know that? Everybody says so. Well, that's what I mean. It's worth checking into. Es posible, but... I still do not think she would do such a thing. It is too terrible. And she's too beautiful. <laughs> Maybe I ought to give you the advice, Gino. Before the beauty of a woman, senor, we are all as brothers, like senor Bla uh, Blakely. I see he would look very disturbed. Yeah, he did get a little hot under the collar. What do you know about him, Gino? Almost nothing. He's come here for three months now, making the road. And his partners, Palmer and Rourke, who were killed in the plane crash. What do you know about them? The same. Nothing. They all arrive together, always. They work together, play together. Then along came Marvel Terrence. True. They were all rivals for the senorita. 
And there is one thing. What's that? They have the building for the machinery outside the city, the warehouse, you call it. What about it? In this warehouse, they keep much dynamite. Gino dropped me in my hotel, the Del Prado, on Avenida Juarez. I changed clothes, cleaned up, sent some telegrams to the States. At about that time, Mac Macklin phoned up from downstairs and asked me to join him in the bar. Expense account item three, $16.40. Drinks and dinner with the chief inspector of the Federal Department of Civil Air Transport. And then some more drinks. I've been here seven years, Johnny. I like it. I feel at home here. I like the people and their way of life. But it'd still be good to see old Shy again. The snow piling up along the loop and the wind ripping in off the lake. The crazy little joints along Baker Street. When were you there last, Mac? Uh, 1932. Oh, then you're about due. Well, why don't you take a couple of weeks and fly up there? No, no. Too much water under the bridge, Johnny. Too many little wars here and there in the world since 32. Mm-hmm. And too often, McMacklin was flying in them. On one side or the other. Oh, what of it? Well, you know, Uncle Sam frowns on that kind of thing, Johnny, so... We've got a sort of an understanding. I stay the heck away, and he forgets about me. I see. <laughs> I've got no complaints, actually. I'm I, I'm doing all right here, but, but sometimes I sure do get homesick for the old town. Of course, it's probably changed so much that I... Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, con permiso de telephone, uh, Senor Macri. Oh, thanks. I uh, plug it in. Hello, yeah? What? All right. Well, have you told the federal police? Yeah, I'll be here for a while. Adios. Well, we just lost our best angle, Johnny. What do you mean? That baggage handler, the one I figured slipped the dynamite on board the plane. The boy's just now located him. His throat has been cut. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bereaved relative lies, a frustrated lover comes up fighting, and a lovely lady in the case just vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Oh? We have not met, Senor Dollar. No, or I'd have been sure to remember the name, Don Serrano. Oh, wait a minute. You're Maria Delago's brother. That is correct. I was planning to call on you this morning, Don Serrano. Well, that will not be necessary, Senor, since I am taking the liberty of calling on you. I am downstairs in your hotel at this moment. Oh, I see. I believe I may be able to cast some light on the unfortunate tragedy which overtook my poor sister and the other passengers of that ill-fated airplane. Do you know something that hasn't come out? Rather a great deal, senor. 
I know the crash which resulted in the deaths of ten innocent people was the evil work of a diabolical maniac. Yes, well... A product of the warped mind of a scheming, worthless, unspeakable dog, a sneaking, money-hungry snake, a scurrilous, unprincipled... Don Serrano! Si, senor. Come on up! Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. Item 5, $3.90, room service. Breakfast for myself and a pot of coffee for my visitor, Don Serrano de Almeido y Pico, I think. He was a thin, straight man with a small goatee and the face of a hawk. Stiff, formal, unbending. A classy grande type from an old school long out of business. And a man of much suppressed violence and hate. Once upon a time, senor, there existed a gentleman's code for the settlement of such matters as this. The duelo, as it was called. But we are living now in lesser and more decadent times. A man is no longer permitted to kill his enemies. He must suffer interference by the police, the Civil Air Transport Department, the government. And even special investigators from the States, huh? Is that what you mean? I was not speaking personally, Senor Dollar. You are as much a victim of the times as I am. Well, it doesn't seem to be irritating me as much. More coffee, Don Serrano? Uh, gracias, no. Perhaps it is because uh, you have not lost your dearly beloved sister, Senor. Oh, maybe. In that, at least, you have my sympathy. But let's get to the point... You've done quite a lot of talking about wanting to kill somebody, but I'm still not too sure who or why or what. It is very simple, senor. Not to me. Suppose we start at the beginning. As you like. But who can ever say what is the beginning of anything? All right, then let's be arbitrary about it. Let's start three weeks ago when your sister Maria came here from Havana to join her husband, Ramon de Lagos. I believe you said Ramon had been here for a month at that time on uh, some kind of a business deal. A business deal? Do I look like a fool, senor? Oh, now, let's stick to the point. Women. That is his business, senor. Women with money. Then a week ago, Maria wired you, said she was terribly unhappy, and asked you to come at once. And when you got here, she told you what was the matter. She said Ramon was carrying on with an American girl named Marvel Terrence. A Jezebel, senor. So you took over. You got Maria an airline reservation back to Havana on Flight 6, the one that crashed. And told her you'd handle Ramon. Oh, she was putty in his hands. He lied to her every day since they were married. And she always ended up by believing him. I told her in the beginning he was interested only in her wealth. Which amounts to how much? Oh, much. Even after Ramon's foolish dissipation over the last few years. What happens to her estate now? Half of it she was permitted to dispose of as she wished. She made a will some time ago in favor of Ramon. Against my advice, I may say. What about the other half? Now that reverts to me, senor. Oh? It is a matter of family tradition. Who managed your sister's estate before Ramon came into the picture? I did, senor. And quite profitably. I did not waste my energies on illicit follies and ludicrous intrigues. All right, all right. Night before last, then, you took Maria to the airport and saw her off on the plane. See. Si. What was she planning to do when she got back to Havana? Was she going to divorce Ramon? My sister was a very pious woman. May she rest in peace. A religion would never permit such an act. I see. And, of course, there was the matter of family tradition. Oh, naturally. Did Ramon go to the airport with you? I had not seen Ramon since the night before, nor had Maria. We had uh, quarreled violently over his disgraceful conduct. Did Ramon know that his wife was taking Flight 6? I informed him the night before. Did you or Maria see him at the airport? Oh, no, senor. He was much too clever. He managed to keep out of sight. Then how can you be sure he was there? Senor Dollar, who else would be so vile as to place an explosive on board the plane? Oh, well, now I can follow your reasoning, but... The matter is self-evident. Well, look, I'm afraid we need more than self-evidence, Don Serrano. Uh, the problem of evidence is your responsibility, senor. I have told you who committed the deed. No, you've told me who you suspect. Do you doubt my word? Not as far as it goes. 
Sure you won't have some more coffee? No, gracias. Do you happen to know this girl, Marvel Terrence? Uh, by sight, I mean. She has been pointed out to me. Mm -hmm. Did you see her at the airport? See, si, I did. I was under the impression she was going to leave on the plane, but after it departed, she was still in the terminal. Did you notice her talking to anyone before the takeoff? Yes, uh, to some American, I believe. Red hair, stocky build, about uh, 35? See, si, he would fit that description. Blakely. Did you see her talking to anyone else? Uh, any of the baggage handlers or the ground crew? I'm afraid I did not notice. Is it important? It could be. Well, uh, thanks for your information, Don Serrano. My only concern is to see justice done. I'm sure it will be. And now suppose we take a look at what you didn't tell me. Senor? The fact that Maria took out a flight accident policy for $25,000 and named you as her beneficiary. Well, I considered it a, a mere whim of my sister's. But the way things turned out, it was a pretty valuable whim, wasn't it, Don Serrano? For you, I mean. Senor, are you implying... I'm implying that Roman wasn't the only one with a motive. Wasn't the only one who'll profit by Maria's death. You'll do pretty well yourself. Half her estate and $25,000 cash, that's not a bad deal. I should kill you for such an insult. You'd like to, wouldn't you? You're very big on this killing business. That's how you planned to handle things with Ramon, wasn't it? As soon as Maria went back to Havana. It is only what he deserves. And now you're trying to use me to do it. That's why you came here. You don't care about justice. All you want to do is get Ramon. He is guilty. If he is, Don Serrano, I'll find it out and I'll pin it on him. But if he isn't, I'm not going to be pushed into framing him. So you can take these dirty, underhanded insinuations of yours and you can... Get out, Don Serrano. Expense account item six, $12.60. Taxi fares in and around Mexico City. I checked with the federal police first. They had their best men working on the murder of the baggage handler at the airport. And so far, they turned up nothing. They didn't have a single lead. I went through their files on the other seven people who died on the plane. Nothing. The two pilots and the stewardess were Cuban and apparently had no close friends or enemies in Mexico City. Two of the passengers were Brazilians and were only traveling through en route from the States. And as far as the other two were concerned, there seemed to be no motive. So it came right back again to the three I was already working on. Maria Delagos and the two business partners, Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke. The three people who'd bought flight insurance policies. And that left me with four possible suspects. Ramon Delagos, Maria's husband, Don Serrano, her brother, Marvel Terrence, and Bill Blakely, the partner of Palmer and Rourke. I checked with Inspector Mocklin, but he'd made no progress. With Gina Romero, no progress. I tried to reach Blakely, but he hadn't shown up at his office. I phoned Marvel Terrence and got a reluctant agreement from her to meet me for lunch. I waited for her at the Vendome for an hour. She didn't show up. Finally, at one o'clock, I went to her hotel. What can I do for you? I'd like to see Miss Marvel Terrence. I wonder if ah, you... Ah, Miss Terrence, que señorita tan bonita, tan hermosa. Yeah, well, if you'll... She's the most beautiful woman where I ever stay at this hotel. Yeah, she's pretty gorgeous, all right. Would you mind and Sometimes telling... I think everybody in the world is in love with this señorita. All day long, it is one man after another which call up to talk to Miss Terrence. Well, would you ring her and tell her I'm Two waiting? Two times so many calls we get on the switchboard while the senorita is living. That's very interesting. And now would you You must forgive me, amigo. When I think of Miss Terrence, I lose all sense in my head. All right, all right. You're forgiven. Now, if you... What is it you wish, senor? Will you ring Miss Terrence and tell her I'm waiting down here in the lobby? I immediately, senor. Your name, please? Johnny Dollar. Johnny... Leo El Tio... How do you spell it, please? D-O-L-L-A-R. L-A-R. Gracias. I will tell her at once that you... Sacre nombre. I had forgot. Forgot what? She's not here no more, senor. What? She has checked out of hotel at 11 o'clock this morning. Expense account item 7, $2.10. Lunch at the Monte Casino Hotel alone. I was sorry she'd skipped... I guess I was secretly hoping Marvel would turn out to be in the clear. But if she were, then why run out? It didn't add up. I paid my check and started to leave the dining room. And at the entrance, I ran square into a man I was planning to see later in the day. He didn't seem very happy about it. Senor Dollar. How are you, Roman? It is a pleasure to see you again, senor. And I'd now, like to talk to you a couple me. of minutes. Come on, uh, let's step into the bar. But I have a most important engagement, senor. Oh, this is important, too. 
I understand you're a friend of Marvel Terrence's. I see. It is my honor and pleasure. Well, she's checked out of the hotel here. Do you know where she went? Oh, senor, I do not discuss the private affairs of my friends. Oh, knock it off, Ramon. This isn't a tea party. Ten people have been murdered by an explosion aboard a plane. One of them was your wife, remember? I cannot help you. I know nothing of Miss Terence's plans. And now, I talked to your brother-in-law me. this morning, Ramon, Don Serrano. He tells me you're the one who put the explosive on board the what? plane. It is a lie. He seemed pretty certain of it. He tells me you stand to inherit half of your wife's estate. Then he is better informed as to the details of the matter than I am. I do not know what happens to the estate, senor. He seems to think you wanted to get your wife out of the way in order to have a free hand with Miss Terrence. Don Serrano, as you may have noticed, is a bigoted and jealous old fool who thinks only of money. He knows better than that. What do you mean? Maria was different from the women of your country, senor. She understood such matters as my friendship with Miss Terrence. And accepted them? Except such times as Don Serrano goaded her into being foolish, yes. It is a difference of the Latin temperament, senor. I see. Then there was no trouble between you and Maria. None of importance. The trouble was Don Serrano. He has hated me from the day of our marriage, because from that moment on he no longer had any control over Maria's fortune. If you wish to discuss this further, senor, I will be happy to do so later, but I must leave now. Con su permiso. I watched him hurry out of the hotel. I had no real reason to stop him and no authority to. On sudden impulse, I crossed the lobby to the public phones, called the Hotel Rejis, and asked for Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Don Serrano had checked out. No forwarding address. I called the Del Prado and asked for Bill Blakely. Mr. Blakely had checked out. No forwarding address. I left the phone booth and hurried back to the desk. The clerk was very sorry. Ramon de Lagos had checked out earlier in the day. No forwarding address. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a rendezvous in a tropic port. And a lot of things come together. Things like romance, desire, and death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Macklin's office, Gino Romero. Oh, Gino. What did you find out? Did you locate any of them, beneficiaries of the crash of Flight 6? Si, senor. It was an affair most simple. A matter of making the telephone call to the airport. Then they've left Mexico City. Si, senor. The senorita Marvel Terrence has taken the 10 o'clock plane this morning to Acapulco. Oh. Senor Blakely has taken the 11.30 plane to Acapulco. Senor Ramon de Lagos has taken the two o'clock... Plane to Acapulco. And what about Don Serrano? Oh, with him, he's different. At 2.45, he's depart from Mexico City in a special charter plane. Look, Gino, is there another flight to Acapulco this afternoon? But, of course, at 4.30. Already, I have two reservations. Good. I'll meet you at the airport. What's the flight number? Gino. I'm uh, scared to think of it. This one is also called Flight 6. <laughs> Thank you. 
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. Item 9, $63.45. Incidentals in Mexico City and plane fare to Acapulco. One more of the sharp contrast of Mexico. We left the stiff formality of the city behind us, the cool, thin air of the high plateau, and 50 minutes later, we stepped off the plane and into the steaming heat of the tropics. Barefoot tourists in shorts and barefoot natives in white cotton dungarees. Soft brown skins and flashing teeth. Mangoes, papayas, and the heady scent of tropical flowers. Blue sky, blue Pacific, and a burning sun. And a bay so bright and beautiful it breaks your heart. Acapulco. Gino Romero of the Department of Civil Air Transport knew his way around. So I waited for him while he checked his contacts, airport police, custom agents, limousine drivers. And in a few minutes, he'd made his rounds and rejoined me in front of the terminal. It is an affair more simple, senor. A merely matter of ask the question and listen to the answer. What did you find out, Gino? The senorita Miss Terns is there at the Hotel Los Flamingos. So? Senor Blakely is also stay there. Ramon de Lagos is go to the Hotel Caleta. And Don Serrano is stay at the Club de Pesca. So you see? Yeah, I see. All right, Gino, let's get going. And where we are going is to the... Uh... We'll put up at the Los Flamingos. That is what I expect. Oh, she's very beautiful, senor. True, but there are even better reasons for staying there. Que dice? Well, in some way, I mean, I'm not sure how. I think this whole thing centers right around Marvel Terrence. You think he's... Possible she are guilty of the crash of the flight six to collect the insurance. Maybe. Or she might have been used. Or maybe... Oh, I don't know, Gino. But it's about time we found out. <laughs> Expense account item 10, $1.50. Limousine fare from the airport to the hotel. The Flamingos is built on a point near the far end of the peninsula, set on a headland high above the white smother of surf below. And there, just before dusk, with the western sky, a yellow blaze of glory beyond the far rim of the Pacific, I found her. She was sitting on the open terrace by the edge of the cliff. And once again, she was alone. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. I suppose I should be surprised. But I'm not, really. I guess I rather expected you. Well, then wasn't it a waste of time to run away from Mexico City? I've always run away, I guess. And most of the time, I imagine you've been followed. Or maybe I wanted to face you here, where it's so beautiful. Where perhaps you'd be able to understand me a little better. Is that what you want, Marble? To be understood? Doesn't every woman? I thought it was more often the man. And usually it's his wife who doesn't understand him, isn't it? I see this isn't going to be just a social chat. <laughs> oh, I doubt if it could ever be just a social chat. Not with you. Now, you've got too much impact for that. A compliment? That's a fact. There's no place else in the world with sunsets like the ones here. Every evening. It's like there's another land way off there in the west. It's a strange, bright, golden land. And it keeps calling, coaxing. Only in a little while, it'll disappear. And everything will be dark off there in the west. Maybe you do understand me, Johnny. Maybe that's why I'm half afraid of you. <laughs> another reason I ran, maybe. I can be a fool, easy. Sort of hereditary defect, you might say. Oh, that's a common affliction. Rarely fatal. Rarely doesn't help. Once is enough. You know something. When I die, I want to be buried up there in the middle of a sunset. It'd be kind of lonely, wouldn't it? I think I've always been lonely. Do you know I haven't a single living relative in the world, not one? I was 14 when my parents were killed in an auto accident. I stayed in a boarding school, and the bank handled the estate. When I was 21, they turned it over to me. And since then, I've... I guess that's not what you want to know, though, is it? Not exactly. 
Want to tell me about it, Marvel? No. As a matter of fact, I don't. I don't even want to think about it. It would be better if you would. For whom? For me? I doubt it. I feel dirty, Johnny. Telling wouldn't change that. It might. Anything I'd tell you would be only suspicion, not fact. What in? Unless, of course, you're expecting a confession. Do you have one to make? No. But you know who caused Flight 6 to blow up and why, don't you? No. I can make a guess, that's all. Like to tell me that guess? You'll find out soon enough, Johnny, and I'd rather it didn't come from me. Eleven people have died, Marvel. I know. Ten on the plane that crashed and the baggage handler who was murdered later and You whoever... don't have to remind me of it. I couldn't forget it if I wanted to. I told you how I felt and I'll drop it, Johnny. All right, all right. I didn't know. That's all I can claim. I just didn't know. What do you mean? Nothing. Look. It's dark out there now. And sunset's gone. There's always another one. I wonder. Have you ever met Don Serrano, brother-in-law of Ramon de Lagos? No, but he was pointed out to me. Did you see him at the airport the night Flight 6 was blown up? I don't remember. I don't think so. Did you see Ramon? No. Did he know you'd canceled your reservation that night? He didn't even know I had one. Have Ramon and Bill Blakely ever met? Yes, they met. And detested each other on sight. Well, that's understandable in view of the circumstances. Well, I guess, but... Why are people like they are? Did you arrange for Blakely to follow you here? I didn't tell anybody I was coming. Well, he was a good guesser. So was Ramon and Don Serrano. I know. They're all here. Why? They don't even know me. They don't want to know me. Not in any real way, but they're here. Oh, yeah, they're here. And I think you ought to tell me what you know, Marvel. Tomorrow, maybe. Not tonight. Let me have just one night, Johnny. All right. Take me to dinner. Dance with me. Laugh with me. Give me just one evening. Will you, Johnny? Sure. And thank my lucky star for the chance. You're sweet. I'm saying it now. Without any strings. No matter how things work out. I'll still mean it. You're a sweet guy, Johnny. Give me time to change. I went to my room and made two phone calls while I waited for her. The operator at the Club de Pesca informed me that Don Serrano was not in. The clerk at the hotel, Caleta, said the same thing about Ramon de Lagos. I didn't leave my name with either of them. Bill Blakely was staying in room 23, a few doors on down the terrace, so I decided to go have a talk with him before I went out to dinner with Marvel Terrence. But as it happened, I didn't have to go to that much trouble. Yeah, who is it? Blakely, I'd like to talk to you. Come on in. Do you always cover your visitors with a gun? Only when I spot them listening outside my door. I don't know. I what saw you... your shadow against the shutter there. You've been standing outside for the last five minutes, Blakely. You listened to me make a couple of phone calls. Did you learn anything you wanted to know? Dollar, suppose you were suspected of sabotaging an airliner and killing ten people. Wouldn't you want to know what kind of a case was being built up against you? What makes you think you're under suspicion, Blakely? I know I am. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were my partners. When they died on that plane, I became sole owner of the firm. There's the motive. I've got a warehouse full of dynamite in Mexico City. There's the method. I can go even farther than that. What do you mean? You mentioned one motive. Why didn't you mention the other one? What other one? Marvel Terrence. That crash not only eliminated a pair of business partners, it wiped out a couple of rivals. <laughs> Just one thing wrong with that dollar. Marvel had a reservation on that plane herself. She only decided at the last minute not to go. I wouldn't have been gaining much if I'd killed her along with my rivals, as you call them. Uh-huh. Maybe that's why you cornered her at the airport and argued her out of going. Yes, I... I did talk her out of the trip. But not because I'd planted an explosive on board. How do you feel about her, Blakely? I'd give my left arm. It wouldn't do any good. I'm just not the guy. I never have been and never will be. Maybe you are... She says she's having dinner with you tonight. That's right. She is. How do you feel about her, Dollar? I don't know. 
Expense account item 11, $26.40. Taxis, dinner, drinks, and dancing for two. The Copacabana with its blue lights and the surf right at your feet and a million stars low enough to touch the warm water of the bay lapping softly at the pilings. The Las Americas, the Casablanca, music, champagne, and the tropic night. And then finally, much later. Good night, Johnny, and thank you. Tonight, for the first time I can remember, I wasn't alone. And then, only an hour afterward, I was wakened out of a sound sleep. Johnny! Senor Dollar. Right with you, Gino. What was it? It's a senorita, I think. She's a number eight. Come on. But she wasn't a number eight. Her door was standing open and the room was empty. We searched the terrace out toward the edge of the cliff where I'd talk with her at sunset. We saw the broken section of railing and found one of her slippers and a pack of her cigarettes lying nearby. In pitch darkness, we slid and scrambled down the steep path to the beach. And there, by the edge of the surf, we found her. The warm foam reached out for her, as though to carry her away. To that last sunset she'd loved so much. She looked very beautiful. Very much alone. As alone and as lonely... Is death. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a desperate killer is cornered and strikes back in a deadly counterattack. Final showdown. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield... It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Here is your call to Mexico City, senor. Oh, thanks. Hello? Macklin, Department of Civil Air Transport. Hi, Mac. Dollar, what have you learned in Acapulco? Uh, Not very much, I'm afraid. But you said you were following the girl down there. Marvel Terrence. Yeah, and a few others who might have had a hand in the explosion aboard Flight 6. Beneficiaries of the insured on that flight. What others? Ramon Delagos, whose wife died in the crash. Don Serrano, her brother. Bill Blakely, whose business partners were aboard. Well, have you and Gino learned anything from them? From the girl? Not yet. But you said she might know who caused that explosion aboard the plane. Right, and she promised to talk. Well? Your little helper, Gino, and I just pulled her body out of the surf down below the hotel here. Johnny. Murder? Yeah. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Acapulco, Mexico... 
to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 12, $1.80 for the phone call to Mac Macklin in Mexico City. I had to get Mac out of bed to tell him what had happened. That Marvel Terrence had been murdered. That somebody had silenced the girl around whom the whole case had seemed to center since Flight 6 had exploded in midair three nights before and carried the passengers and crew to their deaths. Mac was shocked and offered any additional help I might need. But he had no new information at his end, and it was obvious now that any answers would have to be found right here in Acapulco. As I hung up the phone, Gino Romero came rushing in from the hotel terrace. Senor Dollar. What is it, Gino? A prowler is out on the hotel grounds. The police car has got to block off the road at the bottom of the slope. Good, come on. The stairs are over this way, senor. Right with you. A little light wouldn't hurt anything down here. It's no time. This way, into the brush is a footpath. All right, lead the way. Over there is only 100 feet to a cliff. The other side is the road for the hotel. Here is the only place anybody can go. It's down this slope. Yeah, but there are plenty of places to hide. And this in your body is a matter... Oh, wait. Huh? Listen, listen. We could hear someone moving through the jungle growth a few yards away, moving swiftly but cautiously. Then a sudden silence. Whoever it was, it also stopped and was listening for Gino and me. We waited for the fugitive to move again, straining our ears, trying to tag the location. Seconds passed. Then a slight rustle ahead of us. Gino nudged me and we slipped quietly toward the sound. Get your hands up. Well, well. Where is not your senor dollar? You seem to be quite a night owl, Don Serrano. Not ordinarily, senor. The circumstances which place me in this rather awkward position are not usual ones, I assure you. You were up there prowling around the hotel. Why? I was looking for my unmentionable brother-in-law. Armando Lagos? Why? What made you think he'd be here? I went to his hotel... He was not in his room. I knew he had not been able to see Miss Terrence since she had spent the evening with you. So I assumed he might be waiting for her here, at her hotel. And my assumption has, of course, been proven correct. Did you see him? No, but I heard the police discussing the murder of Miss Terrence. It was obviously Ramon's handiwork. Still after him, huh? My feeling about Ramon is not a secret, senor. Nor his about you. So why did you go to his hotel? To kill him. Why else? Time was running out, so we took Don Serrano back to the hotel to the police. One very important person hadn't put in an appearance. Gina went down to Bill Blakely's room, knocked on the door, then opened it with a pass key and went in. Blakely wasn't there. We searched the room. The bed has been sleeping, senor. Yeah, yeah, I notice. But for how long, that's the question. It's possible he was wake up when the senorita screams before she is killed. He might have been... He must have dressed. His pajamas are there on the floor. I wonder. Quien sabe if it was a quarrel of lovers, the jealousy. He did not like it when the senorita was go with you tonight. I don't think it's that simple, Gino. Let's get this bag open. Have a look inside. Maybe we can. It's not even locked. He seems to have been traveling light. He... There on the top, senor. Yeah, I see. What is it? A box of thirty-eight caliber cartridges spilled open. And that piece of oilcloth. He had a gun packed in here. No, it's gone. He got up, loaded a gun and left, took the gun with him. If it was before the scream, that's one thing. But if it was afterward, then... What are you thinking, senor? I think we'd better take the police with us, get over to the Hotel Caleta and check up on our third suspect. Ramon? But Don Serrano said he is not there. Don Serrano could say anything. I think we'd better get over there, Gino, and do it fast. Clerk said room 34. That's the second door down. Let's see. Let's go. Roman. Roman. Who is it? Johnny Dollar. Open up. Watch yourself, Gino. See. Si. Come on in, Dollar. You're Blakely. Yeah. 
Better hand over the gun, Blakely. You won't get a chance to use it now. The police are out in the lobby. Okay. All right, thanks. Ramon didn't show up, huh? I wish he had. That's all I was asking, just one clear shot at him. Are you sure he's the one who killed her? Sure enough. Did you see him? No, but he's the one. She was scared of him, Dollar. She told me earlier in the afternoon, before you got down here to Acapulco. Told you what? She said Ramon had followed her here from Mexico City. That he'd been acting strange. She said she was glad I was staying at the same hotel. And that she didn't want to see him or talk to him. Yeah, it figures all right. It checks with what she said to me last night. If she'd only given me a little more to go on. She was a real great kid, Dollar. The greatest as far as I was concerned. Yeah. As soon as I realized what had happened, I loaded my gun and came here to wait for him. I figured he'd try to get back to his room. But he didn't show. It's too bad. She was a real great kid. And I'd have died for her if she asked me to. I loved her. She was a... Mira, ahí está. There he is. Come on, Gino. Si, sí, senor. Roman had been spotted. He started down to the hotel, saw the police, turned and ran. He was armed with a pistol. He'd fired a shot at one of the police officers and then jumped over the balustrade and disappeared into the dark curve of Caleta Beach. The police cars quickly threw a cordon along the Bayfront Street and blocked off both ends of the stretch of shoreline. For the moment, Roman was trapped somewhere on that beach. He tipped his hand now, and he was desperate and dangerous, and he had a gun. Gino and I went out on the beach after him. There's many places to hide here. Not for long. They'll have some more police here within a few minutes. Come on. It's maybe better we wait, senor. I do not think Ramon is planned to be taken alive. I can still see that girl, Gino, lying at the foot of the cliff. Si, senor. I remember. I... I should spit it down. What is it? There, by the water, is... Oh, no, I am wrong, senor. It's only a boat pulled up on the sand. Yeah, it's a paddle boat. Well, I think it's better maybe we separate, senor. I look in the pavilion, the cabanas. You stay close by the water. In this way, we are have him between us. Good idea, Gino. But you've got the rough end of it. Take care of yourself. Yes, senor. Well... much cover along the shoreline here. Yes. Do not move, senor. Do not make a sound. Well, Roman. So you were hiding behind that boat. I have nothing to lose now, senor. If you make one move or try to call out, I will kill you. Yeah, I think you would. All right, then, what comes next? This boat. You will push it into the water. But be very careful. If you make any noise, even by accident, I will kill you. Quickly now. Hurry. Relax, Ramon. You don't have a chance anyway. We will see. Careful now. Be quiet. Good. Now get in, quickly. Sure. Take the paddle. Head out across the bay and be very quiet or I will kill you. All right, Ramon. You're just wasting your time. They'll have a police launch out here within ten minutes. I do not think so. They will not know. Quiet! Quiet! One more sound from that pedal and I will shoot. Marvel Terrence. Why did you kill her, Ramon? She made me crazy. So beautiful. And with so very much money. I thought she would be most easy once Maria, my wife, was dead. Then it was you who blew up the airliner in order to kill your wife and have a clear field to go after Marvel. Marvel did not know I was married, and Maria was going to tell so her... So you sabotaged a plane and killed her, along with ten other innocent people. And what happened tonight? Did Marvel turn you down? He said she was suspicious of me, and she was going to tell you about it in the morning. And she said she was falling in love with you. She made me crazy. I wish you had got back into that hotel, Ramon. I wish you'd got there before I did, while Bill Blakely was still waiting for you with a loaded gun in his hand. Be quiet and paddle faster. We must get farther up the coast in order... What is that? Police launch. What did you think? I told you you didn't have a chance. No, they could not get here so soon. Well, I forgot to mention the fact that they'd already phoned for one. Then they do not know yet we are out here. Good. Keep paddling. Quickly. He half turned his head to look back toward the launch. He took a chance and swung the paddle. His shot went wild and he didn't get a second try. I caught him back in the air and he dropped like a log. The police located our boat a few minutes later and hauled him over the gunwale and into the launch. 
And that should have been the end of it. But none of us realized Ramon's insane desperation. He'd only been pretending unconsciousness. On board the launch, he snatched a gun from one of the officers and tried to take over the boat. He didn't have a chance. He took a full volley of shots from three police pistols square in the chest. Expense account item 13, $312.20. Hotel and incidentals in Acapulco and Mexico City and plane fare back to the States. Expense account total, $608.10. End of expense account, end of report. Remarks? I'll never see another sunset now without thinking of her somewhere out beyond it. I hope she doesn't feel alone anymore. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a dead girl comes to life in a case that's packed with lies. Yet every one of them comes true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Edgar Barrier, Don Diamond, Russ Thorson, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly... Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. I guess I was pretty obnoxious when you spoke to me a while ago. Well, I suppose I asked for it. I'm staying at the Hotel Monte Cassino. Are you? I'd like to see you again. I could teach you the game, Johnny. Well, that's a very attractive offer, outside of business hours. But you think I'm mixed up in this? No, I'm not sure. Well, think about it, Johnny. And call me at my hotel. The Monte Cassino. That's where DeLagos is staying. Happen to know him? Ramon? Well, yes, of course. Why? Well, one of the passengers killed on that plane was his wife. Didn't you know? I saw the name Delagos, but I... I didn't even know he had a wife. Another? Just for fun? I think you've got some wrong ideas about me, Johnny. Come see me and I'll straighten them out for you. All right. I will. And something else. You'll find it out anyway, so I may as well tell you. Tell me what? I had reservations on Flight 6, too. I was going over to Havana for the weekend. I canceled out at the last minute. I see. Maybe that's why I came out here, to see for myself. I'm not afraid of death. I've tempted it too many times to be. But it does fascinate me. I stood there watching and thinking. It could have been me being carried down that slope. Except for luck. Why did you cancel out at the last minute? I was talked out of making the trip. By whom? Bill Blakely. I watched her swing down the slope, lithe, erect, and lovely. A strange girl, 
with an air of aloneness about her, an air that I felt would be with her even in the crowd. Strange, but also compelling, exciting. She might be involved or she might not. I didn't know. But I was sure of one thing. In either case, I was going to see her again. An hour later, Gino Romero and I were heading back toward the city in the government jeep, leaving behind us the wrecked plain, the crushed trees, and the lonely slope on the mountain. You have found the young lady of interest, senor? Yeah, I found her of interest. <laughs> Always she's doing the crazy things. Daredevil, flirting with the eyes, looking for danger. Playing the game, she calls it. Si, senor, playing the game. Que lastima. It is too sad that ten persons are not be playing the game now anymore. Oh, it's all right, Gino. I'm not that much under a spell. Que dice? If she's guilty in any way, I'll pin it on her just as quick as the next one. Oh, but I did it's not It's all right, mean forget that... it. No, I do not think she's guilty. It is not the thing she would do, and she does not need the money. She's very rich. Do you know that? Everybody says so. Well, that's what I mean. It's worth checking into. Yes, Possible, but I still do not think she would do such a thing. It is too terrible. And she's too beautiful. <laughs> Maybe I ought to give you the advice, Gino. Before the beauty of a woman, senor, we are all as brothers, like senor Blake, uh, Blakely. I see he would look very disturbed. Yeah, he did get a little hot under the collar. What do you know about him, Gino? Almost nothing. He's come here for three months now, making the road. And his partners, Palmer and Rourke, who were killed in the plane crash. What do you know about them? The same. Nothing. They all arrive together, always. They work together, play together. Then along came Marvel Terrence. True. They were all rivals for the senorita. And there is one thing. What's that? They have the building for the machinery outside the city, the warehouse, you call it. What about it? In this warehouse, they keep much dynamite. Gino dropped me in my hotel, the Del Prado, on Avenida Juarez. I changed clothes, cleaned up, sent some telegrams to the States. At about that time, Mac Macklin phoned up from downstairs and asked me to join him in the bar. Expense account item three, $16.40. Drinks and dinner with the chief inspector of the Federal Department of Civil Air Transport. And then some more drinks. I've been here seven years, Johnny. I like it. I feel at home here. I like the people and their way of life. But it'd still be good to see you all shy again. The snow piling up along the loop. The wind ripping in off the lake. The crazy little joints along Baker Street. When were you there last, Mac? 1932. Oh, then you're about due. Well, why don't you take a couple of weeks and fly up there? No, no. Too much water under the bridge, Johnny. Too many little wars here and there in the world since 32. And too often, McMack. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pete Codley, Johnny. Guaranteed transport. Oh, hiya, Pete. Seen the papers? No, I just got up. Why? What's happened? Air crash, for one thing. Air crash? Where? Mexico. Flight 6, Aztec Caribbean line. Mexico City to Havana. Crashed in the mountains ten minutes after takeoff. Seven passengers and a crew of three. Survivors? The way it sounds, none. Oh, tough. How do you come into it, Pete? We underwrite a company that handles flight insurance down there. Three of the passengers bought policies at the airport. We're stuck for $75,000. This is a nice time of the year in Mexico, Johnny. What do you want me to do? Find out why it crashed? No, I know why it crashed. Somebody meant for it to. What do you mean? That plane blew up in midair. I'll get you a reservation. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Flight 6 matter. 
Item one, $173.20. Airline fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Mexico City. I checked my baggage through customs and started making inquiries and more inquiries and then some more. And after the 14th Ken Sabe, maybe is better you ask him, I found the office I was looking for. Or at least I thought I'd found it. The flowery Spanish title on the door translated roughly into Inspector General of the Department of Civil Air Transport. But when I opened the door, I wasn't so sure. Come in, Jack. Make yourself to home. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for and the... you found him. That's me. Don't let the big words on the door fool you. I'm all there is. There ain't no more. So come in. Shut the door. All right, thanks. <laughs> is uh, your name uh, Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. Macklin here. <sighs> Mac Macklin. One time mongrel from the south side of Chicago. I got a wire from your office. Said you'd be in on Pan Am Flight 12. Pull up a chair and squat, will you? All right. Or what were you expecting? <laughs> Spanish grandee with a white silk shirt, a black silk tie, and a second cousin on the cabinet? Well, maybe. At least I wasn't figuring on a south side make with a 17th century desk and a cotton sweatshirt. Uh, well, now, here's what little dope we've got on the crash. Most of which you probably know already. I left on 20-minute notice. All I've seen is one newspaper item. I can use a lot more. Well, you won't get much more out of that report. We got a crew over at the wreckage around two hours ago. Survivors? No, he didn't have a chance. That crate is scattered over ten acres of mountainside. Didn't catch fire, though, so we might turn up something or other. Well, I've got a good man in charge up there, Juno Romero. You'll meet him later. I'm sending another jeep up there in a few minutes, and you can go along if you want. Thanks, I will. My company figures sabotage. Any chance they're wrong? Could it have been accidental? Equipment failure, personnel failure, something like that? Well, if I thought so, I'd be up there at the wreck myself. That'd be my kind of job, but this one's different. You know, it's detective work, your kind of job. And Gino Romero's. Now, he talks as soft as a girl out of finishing school. Looks a little like one, in fact. But underneath it, he's as sharp as a tack and tougher than an old boot full of nails. What actually happened when the plane went down? All I've heard is that it blew up in midair. That's right. Well, a few Indians were on the only ones who saw it. They were burning charcoal up on a slope about 9,000 feet. They were watching the plane circle, gaining altitude. Then one big flash, the tail blew off. Pilot didn't have a chance. He rode it straight into the side of the mountain. The tail? That sounds like the baggage compartment. That's the way I figure it. An explosive of some kind. A time bomb smuggled on board before the takeoff. I'm covering that angle from this end. I'm rounding up every one of the baggage gang, the maintenance crew, anybody who had a chance to get near that plane before it left the field out there. And what have you found out? Well, so far, nothing. We're trying to check back, too, on the individual passengers, the plane crew, trying to find out... Who might benefit by having any one of them dead? Well, I guess that'll be your angle, too. Yeah. Yeah, at least as far as insurance is concerned. Well, there were three flight policies issued, and the names are in the reports here. Somewhere. Yeah, I know. I've got them. The home office gave them to me, along with the names of the beneficiaries. I haven't talked to any of them yet. I figured that you know how to go about it better than I would. And there's another possible insurance angle, and that's the cargo. Do you know if there was anything valuable on board? Worth destroying for the insurance, you mean... No, it was done by somebody who deliberately set out to kill one of the ten people on board that plane. And who didn't mind killing nine others to get them? From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. I was taking Gino Romero's word for it that the girl was a tiger. His word and my own instincts. At first glance, she seemed soft, shy, and lovely. Then you sensed a wildness about her, a kind of suppressed violence that brought you up short and made you stop and reappraise her. She leaned against a tree, watching the bodies of the plane crash victims being carried down the slope and placed in the army jeep, with no sign of emotion on her face. Cool, detached. She had no reason to be here, and I wondered why she was. The only way I knew of finding out was to ask her. Yes, what is it? You're Marvel Terrence, I believe. That's right, and I've not met you somewhere before. No, but you're about to. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an investigator for an insurance company up in the States. I'm sure it must be very interesting work. Sometimes, on some jobs. Other times, it's only dirty and disgusting. 
Like this time, for instance. Well, we all have our problems. Maybe I can help you with yours, Miss Terrence. Run along, will you? I'm not in the mood. Oh, you amaze me. I think that seeing ten bodies picked up and hauled away ought to put anyone in a gay, carefree mood. Look, beat it. You came out here sightseeing, didn't you, 20 miles from town? So you must like this kind of thing. I had friends on that plane, Mr. Dollar. So did a lot of other people. But maybe not as good friends as you had. I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't care. E.H. Palmer and Jim Rourke? Were those your friends, Miss Terrence? Now, let's get this straight. I'm not interested in playing footsies or any other game you have in mind. You're wasting your time, Buster. Now, get going. Oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe you've got the wrong idea. This isn't just a social chat. No, you want to help me with my problems. Just one problem. I'm wondering how you're going to spend that $50,000. What? Yeah, that's a fair-sized chunk of money to drop right out of the sky. What are you talking about? What $50,000? The money you'll get from the deaths of your two friends, Palmer and Rourke. What do you mean? Say, tell me, were you with them at the airport last night when Flight 6 took off? Yes, I was. Then you must have known that they both took out flight policies and that both of them named you as beneficiary. No. No, I didn't know. I... I wasn't with them, exactly. At least, not up until takeoff. Then you claim this is all just a big surprise. Of course, I didn't know a thing about it. But it's just like them. It's what they do. Why did you come out here to the wreck, Miss Terrence? I don't know. Ed and Jim were my friends, and I... I don't know why I came, Mr. Dollar. She came because I brought her, mister. Hmm? No, Bill. But I didn't bring her here to be pushed around by some morbid curiosity, huh? No, please. This is Johnny Dollar, Bill. He's an insurance investigator. Bill Blakely, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello. He was asking me some questions. Why you? Because Ed and Jim both took out insurance policies in my name. What? Flight accident policies, $50,000 worth. Well, I'll Mr. Be... Blakely, you said Miss Terrence is here because you brought her. I wonder if you'd tell me why you're here. I don't know that it's any of your business. Sometimes I make things my business. Then sometime you may get your teeth knocked out. They're in pretty solid, Blakely. Yeah? Well, maybe... Bill, stop it. Sorry, Marvel. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were Bill's business partners. What business, Mr. Blakely? Engineering. We're building some roads around Mexico City. How many partners? Just the three of you? Yeah, it's just... That's right, Dollar. The business belongs to me now. What about it? Nothing about it. Congratulations. One more crack Bill, like that. Bill, I said I... stop it. Let's go, Marvel. I've got to get back to town. Wait for me at the truck. I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. Suit yourself. Dollar, just one thing. Don't push me. Blakely, ten people died over there on that hillside last night. They were murdered. I intend to find out who did it. And if it takes pushing to find out, then I'll push. See you around. Yeah. You probably will. This thing hit Bill pretty hard, Mr. Dollar. You have to make allowances. How long have you known him? A couple of months. And Palmer and Rourke? The same. It's nothing serious, nothing romantic, if that's what you're thinking. It was all just for fun. Was that all it was on their side? Oh, men always claim to be serious. But that's only part of the game. What else do you do, Miss Terrence? Besides play the game. That's all. I'm a wealthy orphan, Mr. Dollar, and my only career is drifting around the world playing the game. I'm ornamental, irresponsible, and rather useless. Maybe not entirely useless. Just being ornamental has some importance in this world. So you play... One of the soldados, uh, Pascual, who have used much explosive, is think maybe 30 or 40 pounds. Light enough to be put on board in a piece of luggage. It's going to be tough, you know. Plenty tough to... They're bringing out the bodies. The Indians set up a low, wailing dirge. And one of them taps softly on a native drum. A wordless terror before the ancient mystery, death. One by one, the bodies passed us, borne by the silent soldiers. Padre de Dios, may they find peace. And then, for the first time, I noticed the girl, standing alone some distance away, watching without expression as the stretches passed her. She was young, blonde, and beautiful. Not conventionally so, but beautiful as a young animal is beautiful. And she looked very much out of place. Uh, you are observing the senorita, no? What's she doing up here? Quien sabe? She's strange, that one. Always she's look for danger. She's what you say, um, the, the daredevil. 
But it's like she always has the charm. Death has never found her. So perhaps she has come here to look on his face. Do you know who she is? Well, see, she's American. Her name is Marvel Terrence. Marvel Terrence? You have heard of her, senor? I'd heard of her, all right. And I'd wondered what kind of a girl would have a first name like Marvel. And now I knew, partly at least. And I planned to find out a whole lot more. Three of the people who died on that plane had taken out flight policies. Maria de Lagos was one of them. The other two were men. Both of whom had named as beneficiary Marvel Terrence. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fighting girl and a lucky break. And then murder cancels the score. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar here. Go ahead. Mac Macklin, Johnny. Is Gino around? Yeah, he's over across the slope at the moment. They're getting the bodies out of what's left of the plane. Well, how does it look? Anything new? Nothing we hadn't already guessed. It was an explosion, all right. Dynamite in the baggage compartment. Probably put on board in a piece of luggage. Well, that figures. I've run into something down here in the city along those same lines. What do you mean? The ground crew remembers one of the baggage handlers acting strange before Flight 6 took off last night. A man named Ramirez. What do you mean, strange? Uh, they say he had one suitcase that he wouldn't let any of the other handlers touch. Put it on the plane himself just before takeoff. Hmm. Hey, you know anything about tigers, Mac? Tigers? I'm about to tangle with one. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. That one, it was premeditated, cold-blooded. Now oh, you get him, Johnny. Get him for me, and then just leave me alone with him for about... Uh... Come in. One of you is Senor McLean, Inspector General de Departamento... Yes, Civil... that, that's me. What can I do for you, Jack? They will not give to me any information, Senor McLean. Not the police, nor the airline office, nor oh, any... Who are you? And what information do you want? I am Ramon de Lagos, Senor, and I am here... De Lagos? Wait a minute. That's the name of one of the... Yes. Guys. Look, uh, are you related to Maria de Lagos? My wife. She was on the plane. Now tell me, please, what news do you have? Have you reached the scene of the crash? Yes, we have. Two hours ago. And what did you... Is there any chance... I'm sorry, there were no survivors... No. 
Oh, no. Hey, I'm sorry, Senor de Lagos. It is too terrible. I, I didn't know you were here in the city, or I'd have, I'd have let you know right away. I sent word to your office in Havana. I, I have been here for six weeks. Maria came for a visit only a few days ago. No. I know, it's, it's a rough deal. I, I, I am sorry. Oh, uh, uh, this is Johnny Dollar from the States. Senor. Let us see. He's here to investigate the cause of this thing. What is the use, senor? It will not return life to the dead. No, but I don't like to see a murderer get away with it. A murderer? Then the rumors are true. The plane was destroyed deliberately. It is hard to believe that anyone would... Senor McLean, what arrangements are being made? The, uh, the bodies will be brought down to the Federal District Hospital, and I'll see that you're notified. Gracias, senor. No, no, let's see. I, I believe your wife's brother, Don Serrano, is staying at the Hotel Regis. Yes, he is, but I am at the Monte Cassino. Don Serrano and I are not friendly. I see. All right, senor, then I'll contact you at the Monte Cassino as soon as I have word. You are very kind. And again, I'm... Well, I, I'm sorry. I... Yes, that is all one can say. Adios, senores. Know anything about him, Mac? Well, only what his wife filled out on the flight form. He's Cuban. Residence and business address, Havana. In the export game. And you know, of course, that his wife was one of the three people who took out accident policies. But naming her brother, Don Serrano, as beneficiary. I wonder why. Well, that's one of the six dozen questions you can ask when you start prowling. Now, look, I hate to rush you, Johnny, but I ought to start that jeep up the mountain. I'm ready any time. I'll let Gino know you're coming. And you check with me if you want anything. You'll have full cooperation from the federal police and the government. And to repeat just one thing, Johnny. Yeah, I know. Whoever did it, get him. Check. The jeep driver was a young Mexican boy who'd been brought up in the best and wildest chauffeuring traditions of the capital. He knew only one way to drive, with both accelerator and horn wide open. Since most of the other drivers were playing the same game, it was a sheer miracle that we ever got through the narrow streets of the city and finally reached the open valley. Maybe the colored postcard pasted on the dashboard, a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe, had something to do with it. We finally left the last cart road and bumped along a narrow woodcutter's trail, cleared and widened enough now so that we could drive into the crash area and miss the mile and a half walk the first rescue party had been forced to take. For some reason, only a small part of the wreckage had caught fire and burned, and the rest was strewn piecemeal along a great raw gash through the trees and brush. Men in uniforms of the Mexican army searched through the tragic debris, lifting, sorting, and collecting. And nearby, a silent group of Indians were watching with the age-old sadness in their eyes. Uh, you are uh, Senor Dollar, no? Yes. Uh, Gino Romero, Senor. Oh, glad to know you, Gino. It's a terrible thing, no? Yeah. Any ideas yet? Uh, not of importance, but it's certain now this. It was caused by one explosion which has occurred in the baggage compartimento. Uh, venga, uh, come on. We have found many pieces which can be identified, uh, can be known which part of the plane they are in before the crash. I see. Uh, toward the front, these pieces are more large, but in the back, near the tail, they are very little. Oh, here, uh, you look. These are pieces of the baggage, uh, muy pequeño, hmm? uh, very tiny. Oh, yeah, the crash itself wouldn't have done this. It had to be an explosion. Seguro. Uh, look. Is burnt a little, each one of these pieces, but these more big ones from the seats of the plane, they are not burnt. Here, uh, you smell these ones. Mm. Yeah, I see what you mean. Either dynamite or nitroglycerin. Well, dynamite. We have found little tiny pieces of red paper from the wrappings on the sticks. Was dynamite. Any idea how much, how big a charge? 